to City Council of Business Administration, uh, Professional Service Agreement, Review of Position, Classification, and Compensation Plan. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, City of Worthington and, and Public Utilities Position Classification and Compensation Plan was adopted by the City Council in 1988 and had minor amendments later in 1991. Under the current plan, positions are classified into one of 15 non-exempt or hourly positions or 12 exempt salaried, salary positions. Classification is based on total points assigned from nine separate position factors, and these factors include job complexity, contacts with others, education, experience, certification requirements, pressure, stress, and hazards, physical demands, scope of decisions, and responsibilities for others. While the current plan is in compliance with Minnesota's Department of Employee Relations Pay Equity and the Local Government Pay Equity Act, the city and Worthington Public Utilities are faced with a growing challenge of attracting and keeping a talented workforce. It's also the policy of our organizations that the employees' salaries are determined on a fair and equitable basis basis. In addition to reviewing the compensation plan, we would also uh, review employee benefits and performance assessment. With that in mind, staff has been in discussions with ABDO Solutions to provide an initial review and possibly lead us through a more comprehensive revision of our compensation plan. Scope of work for this phase of work is detailed on page 7 of ABDO's proposal. The estimated fee for the scope of work outline is $2,000 to $2,200. Staff recommends this fee be paid with unallocated ARP funds, which has a current balance of $258,498. Open to any discussion. What exact? Oh, excuse me. Okay. All right. um, go ahead, Amy. Um, what exactly are they? They're doing like an initial evaluation, and what would be the additional well, potential the, that they could give the, you? In it? Right now, the evaluation is just to assess the current plan, mm -hmm. uh, if and make comments or recommendations based on what that plan is. If we move into, uh, say, a more involved rewriting of the compensation plan, that would be another phase that. And they, they would, would lead us with that. Yes. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Uh, do they have uh, a reference list that you've checked out? We, we have not. ABDO is the uh, firm that we uh, retained earlier this year to do our audit, and we've been very impressed with their services with that. Uh, I sat in on one Zoom meeting with this group. And then Scott Hain and I sat in on a, on a second meeting with them, and our judgment was that they had a very firm grasp of of this and have done uh, this type of work with a number of cities. I don't have a list of those cities, but... Uh, Is that like renaming some of the positions that as well? That maybe and reclassifying them. Uh, uh, you know, there's just, there's a lot of things that were done in the late 80s that maybe aren't as relevant today. Describe different, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so it's, there are a few things we want to get uh, maybe cleaned up and modernized or at least review to see if we need to modernize them in the, in the next uh, couple of years. Uh, the timing of this, if we do get into more of a full-fledged uh, look or review of our compensation plan is to have that done in about a year's time from now, which would coincide with uh, our union contracts all run through December of 2024. So this would put us into uh, late spring, early summer of 2024 would be our ultimate goal if we're going to make any major uh, revisions so that uh, we would have that done ahead of union negotiations and, and budgeting moving forward into 2025. Mm -hmm. Lena? Since ABDO um, reviews benefits quite often, would they have any recommendations maybe for some cost savings or different? Like the, 
different plans that we could use than what the, we're currently using? I guess what I'm looking at is our, not only with our benefits, but also, you know, uh, uh, vacation schedules, uh, some of those things. We are starting to undertake a review of our health insurance uh, options that we'll, uh, you know, we had a tremendous increase in 2024. So, but we were still tied in with our current carrier through 2024. So we are going to be looking at other options uh, for next year and, and moving forward. But uh, they're not a, they will not be reviewing the uh, health insurance program. After working with them or talking to them on the phone, you feel like they'll give you what you're looking for? Like, Yes. We, we did this five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. We're not happy with the resulting uh, report that we got. And we went through some of those shortcomings, and they seem to uh, present themselves as having been well aware of what we didn't receive and what we would receive in this review. Good. Has there been a specific? Uh, specific um, trigger for this right there, now? Yeah, there's there's a couple of things with with our our nine point review to point people. There just seem to be some things that don't quite make sense. One of them is uh, the the common example I use is when you uh, one of the uh, uh, points of review is certifications. So if a position does not require any certifications, they get 30 points. The maximum points you can get for needing certifications is 40 points. So some of those things just don't really make sense to us. Some of the certifications that are required, and they're becoming more and more complex as, you know, our engineering technicians have to have more complex certifications, which is a, a good example that I can use. They get 10 points more than somebody that doesn't have to have any type of certification at all, which amounts to maybe one pay grade. Uh, the, the other thing that we struggle with is our annual employer review uh, form. There's 11 separate categories with three questions within each category, and you score them uh, one to five in each of those 33 areas, too many of those questions don't apply to every employee. So then the, the supervisor struggles with, well, how do I score something that doesn't apply to this position or this individual? And it, so that's one thing I really want to look at is a, is a, a maybe a different review process when we do our annual reviews for everybody. Any other discussion? Otherwise, do we have a motion? Move to approve the contract with ABDO out of the ARP funds. Motion, we need a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Okay, on to uh, public works. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Council. Uh, the first one we have is the 22-23 Worthington Soccer League Agreement. Uh, city staff w met with the members of the Worthington Soccer League on March 25th of 2023, in which we were informed of their intent to continue with the Adult Soccer League for the 2023 season. Uh, the Park and Recreation Advisory Board at their April 5th meeting discussed and unanimously approved the proposed 23 agreement. Uh, the annual fee for 23 will be $200, $250 per team, and this is a 25% increase over what was charged in 2022. Uh, under the agreement, the Worthington Soccer League may utilize the outdoor soccer fields at Bus Field for the purpose of playing organized games. Uh, the Worthington Soccer League shall be responsible for cleanup of the facilities in a timely manner and may use the restroom facilities at Bus Field. Council action is requested to approve the agreement and authorize the mayor and city clerk to sign the agreement. Any discussion? Amy? Are we only using soccer fields for adult league this year, or will other people be able to use it as well? There there are some, uh, I think the Worthington United under-19 team is playing there. Uh, the YMCA uses it. 
The school uses it for their C squad soccer games, I believe. Uh, so, so mostly just, just organized games. organized games. Yes. So if somebody wants to go out there and utilize those fields, they can't. Well, we don't necessarily. Um, we don't want them to any more than than they do. Some ki- some people go down there and play on it. We try not to have uh, a bunch of practices out there. Uh, for one thing, th- the fields get a lot of use the way it is. Uh, Minnesota West practices out there also. Um, so yeah, we don't let pickup games go. Um, we try not to. Um, we try to direct them to Southeast Park where we have goals and fields lined and stuff like that. So um, we try to keep them off there as much as possible. So, you know, like on East Avenue, they always must have pickup games there. Yep, yep. Even and that's, on the preliminary uh, grounds, yep. too. That they, they, they've they got our softball <clears throat> fields just wore down to dirt um, at Centennial. Um, so we try to keep them off the main softball field there where they're playing, but the other one, how uh, they play on. They, they play on any green space we can. We have a real need for soccer fields, so um, we try to get them out to go to Southeast Park. That's where we don't allow the adult soccer league uh, to practice down there either. We, you know, we say you know no practices down there. <laughs> Remind me where Southeast Park? Uh, it's by the Frosty Riders building on East Avenue and uh, between Nobles and East Avenue. Can we maybe at least get some netting for their yep we, goals? Yep, we, their goals didn't have netting. They were older goals that we set out there, but we've got nets now that we put on and stuff. We did starting last year, okay. and we're actually going to line those fields and. Uh, make them more, you know, so so they've got boundaries and stuff like that. Um, it's not ideal, but it's one of the spots we got. You now the church on Douglas allows, looks like they practice there, so they've got some. Yeah, that's another green space where they play. Uh, so. Any other discussion? Um, do you know how many teams are there? Are they at 22 or 24 teams? Well, they had, and part of the reason uh, that we, we are doing this by the team, in the old days, before pre-COVID, we did $4,000 base fee based on 20 teams. Um, COVID hit. They didn't have it one year. The second year, they weren't sure how many teams they were going to have, so we did it by $200 per team. Um, last year, they had 24 teams at $200 a team, and they're anticipating at least 24 teams. And I said, if you're going to have that many teams, uh, $200 isn't enough. We went to 250 and we may have to increase that in the future. Um, but... We, we feel that there's a benefit beyond just the money they pay us because they have anywhere from 500 people down there at a time. Um, and ha- over half of their teams are from not from Worthington. So there's a lot of people coming into town. With all those organizations looking for field time, do you have a calendar that's filled out? So if somebody comes in and says, hey, is the this particular weekend or day or yep, Friday? Yep, yep. Our, our person that uh, maintains the soccer fields keeps a calendar, and that's how we direct them to them. And he, he schedules all the practices and games and uh, Y games and uh, Worthington United games now and stuff like that. Okay. It's it's back, used back, quite often. Back in the day, I think the softball fields were costed that much to per team to rent yeah. their season. Yeah. Hey, council, anything else? Otherwise, do we have a motion? Move to approve. Okay, second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. No further discussion? Okay. Motion carried. Uh, the next one we have is the liquor store parking lot uh, construction services proposal. <coughs> uh, on February 22nd of 2023, bids were opened for the Worthington Municipal Parking Lot Reconstruction Project and were presented to Council at their February 27th, 23 meeting. Uh, Council accepted the low bid and has contracted with Beltline Contract to complete the project. Bolton and Mink, our engineers on the project, have submitted task order number 19, a construction services proposal to oversee the project's construction administration. Uh, The proposed cost for these services is estimated to be $23,500, and these costs are based on the master services agreement that the City of Worthington currently has in place with the firm. Council action is requested to approve tax Task order number 19. Council, any questions, discussion? Is, is this included in, like, the overall cost of what we thought the parking lot would be? Yeah. Okay. It, it, and, yeah, we knew this was coming, and we were actually um, under by um, about thirty some thousand dollars on the bid. So we're still so, under budget. Yeah, yeah, we're still right at, right at there. I'll move to approve. Second. second. Motion seconded. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Uh, 
The last one is uh, resolutions accepting park bench donations. Uh, the Park and Recreation Advisory Committee has received two re requests uh, to place benches in city parks. The requests are as follows. Scott and Melissa Erickson to place a bench in Centennial Park in memory of Norman and Nancy Tierink, and Denise Schlichty to, pl to place a bench in Chautauqua Park, Banchel in memory of Dean and Diane Yankee. Uh, the applications and resolutions accepting the donation of the benches are included as Exhibit 4 and 5. Uh, the donations meet all the requirements as set forth in the park donation policy, and the Park and Recreation Advisory Board recommends that City Council accept the donations. Council action is requested to adopt the resolutions. Council, any questions? Second. Motion seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Any further discussion? Motion carried. Thank you. Engineering. Good afternoon. Two items for you. The first one is uh, approved plans for the Second Avenue, that's uh, Nobles County's County State Highway Number 25. That's for the reconstruction of that two blocks of street from uh, 10th Street over to 12th Street. Uh, the consultant Bolton and Mink has prepared plans and specifications for the reconstruction of Second Avenue. The package has been approved by the Nobles County and the Minnesota Department of Transportation. This project will provide a two-lane roadway with 10-foot parallel parking, 50-foot uh, total width. That will match up with how the street is currently at, so we, want, we don't want to narrow it up. We want to keep that same street width. Uh, the project also includes storm sewer reconstruction, the reconstruction of the sanitary services, and the water main uh, fire service to the active living center, which goes down the park uh, alley um, that behind the building there is where it connects in. Um, the sanitary sewer water main services were previously reconstructed in 2020. So uh, we were looking at, instead of just patching back the surface that was there because of the condition of the sidewalk, the curb and gutter of the street in general, we thought this was an appropriate time to upgrade that street and get that taken care of. Um, so the anticipated uh, submittal uh, completion date for this, uh, our substantial completion date for this project is September 8th of 2023. That gets them a week before the uh, Turkey Day celebration. And with the contract completion date of September 30th, which would be if there's some touch-up work or something that has to be done in there, they got to get like, grass to seed rain, minor things they have to fix up after that. The staff recommends that council approve the plans and authorize an advertisement for bids to be received on Wednesday, May 3rd, uh, 2023 at 2 o'clock p.m., and then the consideration at the council meeting for award of the bids on Monday, May 8th, in 2023. Staff recommendation is to approve resolution uh, as included in exhibit number one to approve the plan specifications and authorize the advertisement for bids. Elena? Do we think we're cutting it a little bit too close if we have the, you know, the substantial completion date right before Turkey Day? Uh, no, we should be able to get it done. Uh, uh, we're not anticipating the same situations as we had maybe on dead end eighth uh, with with some delays and things like this. We we really only the center the storm sewer is fairly straightforward. There's no testing of lines, those types of things that you have to do that could that can create some delays in your timing. Um, and uh, we we feel that with uh, with a two block area, so this it should move along fairly quickly. Biggest delay we'd anticipate is. The, the curing of the concrete, uh, you know, for it to gain strength enough to switch over and put traffic or something on the street for them to bring the uh, concrete trucks in to do the other half of the road, that type of thing. And then when you're doing sidewalks and stuff, there's just a little bit of timing and getting those formed up and ready to go. But we, we feel pretty good. Initially, they had it set for the 15th. <laughs> so we moved it back a week from what the consultant was initially thinking. And we had a long conversation about possibly if they start earlier, they might even get this done a little bit uh, sooner than that. But if they get started a little bit later, we just want to make sure that they get that done by the weekend. Okay. Any other further discussion? Do we have a motion? Move to approve. Second. Okay. We have a motion and seconded. Uh, uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Any discussion? Okay. Motion carried. Um, the second is an update on the East Okabina Lake Trail. Uh, if you remember earlier this year, we had asked the council to uh, uh, support a uh, application for funding for that trail. That would be the one that would go from the Lake uh, Street, 2nd uh, Avenue 
intersection area down by the bike bridge, but past the uh, the field house, and then underneath the railroad track over to Sherwood, and then we go down Sherwood to the east past the soccer fields at Bus Field, and then there's a, a, a residential street and a platted street right-of-way that goes uh, over to Noble Street and then over to Trunk Highway uh, 60 where the trail comes across Highway 60 and we have a trail already goes along the east side of town on Highway 60. This will make a nice connection of the trail around the lake over to serve that part of the community. It's an isolated area because of the railroad track, so this gives us a nice connection. The existing underpass where the street goes is just too narrow to safely get pedestrians and bicycles underneath there without without some significant risk. So uh, the application went in and this was uh, this project was selected by the Area Transportation Partnership and uh, and is going to be funded in, in 2027. Uh, we had a selection of dates. We picked 2027 because we, we felt that we might need a little extra time for the acquisition of right-of-way and authorization, you know, from property owners in the railroad to use that underpass underneath the railroad track. So at this point, uh, uh, we have the funding targeted for 2027. There is some cost participation. The total project cost was estimated at $885,000. Of that, we're looking at about uh, $592,000 of would be federal funding, 80%. And then uh, the rest of the funding would be from the local funding of $293,000. That would include 20% uh, of the construction costs, along which is about $148,000. Uh, we're looking at about $145,000 for engineering uh, contingency uh, uh, fund just in case things, you know, fluctuate in, in construction, something else comes up we're not anticipating, and also acquisition of right-of-way uh, for for the trail uh, through some private property. Yes, Chad. Should the right-of-way grant be given any earlier? Is that anything we could do any sooner than 2027 knowing, or do they say, you do it early, you don't get funding uh, on the federal side? Could we get it done earlier just for the perspective of, what our costs going to be three years from now, opposed to now, if we get the right of ways that we need and the plan is done, could we? We we may have the opportunity if the money is all allocated out. The only way that might become a possibility would be if somebody else who has funding scheduled earlier was able to uh, uh, wasn't ready and they were able to switch with somebody who's programmed later that got theirs ready ahead of time. The other option may be that we might be able to go ahead and fund the project uh, and get it done and then receive our federal funding following the, a, a year that's later. That's my question. Yeah. If we did it that way, would we, we wouldn't be booted from the federal grant funds? Gen we may have to wait a year after it's done or whatever, but would we still be able to get them if by chance we could get it done earlier? I believe we would be able to get the federal funding at an earlier time. Uh, Got to remember too, the federal funding system is a little bit different. Yeah. Uh, the state, the state's year starts ends on June 31st. The federal year is is I think September 31st. But the state allows you to go ahead with a project uh, during that summer because the project is in, in, in is already going and they will start fun, fr fronting money after July 1st. So you could actually could get it done a year ahead of time without really any problems because of the timing of the federal fiscal years for the federal and the state. And the money actually becomes available in the in 2026, but you have to have it allocated out by 2027 construction year. So, so we have options on this, but we we just want to be careful because if you don't get it done in time, that could become more of a problem in losing the funding than than uh, getting it done earlier. I would rather do it earlier than sit and wait um, because I think it's really needed. Yeah, um, and I think it's absolutely going to get used, especially to connect that east side of town and the lake and the softball fields, I think it's no-brainer. That's why I'm like, can you yep. push it ahead? If we chose to fund it somehow, we found a funding source with a little creative looking or whatever we could do, then we could do it earlier if we get all the right-of-ways and approvals. 
and not lose that federal grant funds. That, that was basically what yep. I was saying. And, and that takes us to the last part of the next step is to hire a consultant to get the process started. And because it is federal money, there's a little bit more of a process to go through for acquisition of right of way and, and environmental studies and things like this. So we really want to get started on this as soon as we can to get this project ready to go as quick as we can. Uh, so at this point, this is more just information, but we're planning on going ahead and hiring a consultant uh, to, to bring back to council for a, a, a professional services agreement. And then from there we'll have you approve that, and we'll get the we'll get a consultant started on this. Then, so that would be the next step. But I just want to also make you aware of what the local cost would be, and we have time to line up where all that funding is going to come from. But but that's the commitment we're making and stuff. When we did the applications, we're going to move forward with the project, and we're going to have some local costs on it. Any other questions? <clears throat> all right. Do we have a motion? Nope. We don't. Okay. Just information for you. We'll bring back something for for uh, action once we get a consultant lined up for you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, on to uh, community development. All right, good afternoon. Uh, first on the agenda here is a text amendment to City Code Chapter 97. So this is a text amendment to City Code Section 9715. Uh, the proposed Amendment would remove the requirement that auto repair shops must screen all inoperable vehicles behind a six-foot-tall screening fence. <laughs> At its April 4th meeting, the Planning Commission held a public hearing and voted unanimously to recommend approval of the proposed text amendment. Uh, going on there, you can see all the things that their recommendation was based off of. Essentially, this is a follow-up to a recent conditional use permit, um, in which case they found that the screening really wasn't appropriate for that particular case and so we should remove this. Um, the six inoperable vehicles will remain in place as well as all auto repair shops will still be by conditional use permit only. So we're not completely undoing that 2020 ordinance, uh, just the screening portion of that. So should council concur with the findings, it may approve the requested proposed ordinance in exhibit one. Chad? I guess my question on this is I mean, I, I get the screen part because in some situations, elevations, buildings, property, you could put up a screen and it still doesn't block anything. I, I, I get that. But to sit and change the ordinance that we created and still have some things on there, are we enforcing those? And if we're not, then my question is, why are we just sitting here changing it, for one thing, when one of the main things isn't even being enforced? Do we have teeth? Can we enforce it? Uh, is it being monitored? Who's monitoring it? And if it is being monitored and nothing's being done, why? I think the biggest challenge we have is how do you define or identify an inoperable vehicle, uh, especially at a at a going successful repair shop. Uh, we do have maybe one or two places that have been storing uh, what I think most of us would identify as inoperable vehicles that are. And that's my point. If you go by some places, you can see the same vehicle that has been there for over a year. Is that vehicle insured? Are the tabs current? And can you go to that owner and say, has that person been paid for or done whatever, or do we need to get it off the property? I think those are enforceable and actable items that I just don't think we're just not doing because it's uncomfortable, because it's not pleasant. But... If we got rid of a bunch of vehicles that weren't being paid for, were uninsured and unlicensed, then why are they allowed to be out there? Because I can't technically have that on my property at mm -hmm. my house. So why should we allow a business to have that for so long? Those are the things that I, I'm fine with the screen thing. And this is just, sorry, this the back, the come around is coming back on this, but to sit here and change an ordinance we put together for the main reason of cleaning up the eyesores, which is mostly totally inoperable vehicles that are not licensed, 
probably are not insured that have sat there for X number. If I can get a parking ticket on Main Street because I've been there for over two hours, because somebody walked by with a chalk mark and did that, I guarantee you, you can drive by the less than two dozen automobile repair shops in town and say that vehicle has been here for a year or six months or whatever and track that. That's my only point. And when we have pursued this in sympathy to our repair shop owners, oftentimes what it is is someone brings a car in for repair, gets repaired, and then they can't afford to pay for it, so they can't retrieve it, or they bring it there, get an estimate on the repairs, don't want to invest that kind of money and walk away from the car. So then the repair shop owner is stuck with essentially an abandoned vehicle that they have difficulty with it to get the title changed so that they can dispose of it. Uh, I guess one option is eventually I think the Prairie Justice Center is going to have a area set up for uh, impounded vehicles to get them out of sight. So, I mean, we could work with these repair shops if they have abandoned vehicles. We could at least move them to a different location so that they're not quite the eyesore that they are. They can auction them off or something just for... When, once they, yeah. you know, I think they have, according to law enforcement, they have streamlined the uh, process to get the title work done on an abandoned vehicle. Uh, so it's... That's been the main thing is our small businesses are the ones getting stuck with this because people are yeah. walking away from their their vehicles and they have little option to dispose of them. So if we can come up with the, some sort of uh, so solution with them. So can, can an administrative fee be tagged to that for the towing process? No different than... If you don't mow your yard and we have to send mm -hmm. someone to mow it or scoop your snow and we have to send someone to, to do it, that we can assist our good upholding businesses and say, fine, it's registered to somebody mm -hmm. with an address. At least it was. If that's the best we can do and it can get them their lot cleaned up, can we then get it towed to an impound lot and administratively right. charge those people so it isn't stuck on the business owner who is just getting dumped on. Because I don't think we have too many that are just allowing it because of the goodness of their heart. They're mad about the situation too, but for them to have to pay for it, they've already done whatever possible work to it or whatever. Can we have it towed? assessed a fee and done whatever and put on our assessed projects of the year to help those business owners in those situations. Or we could maybe call the get and go, just give them the vehicle just to get rid of it. If, if you know, who has state. that authority? Yeah, that's just all of a sudden yeah. if they want to come back and sue that business owner, that's a whole different thing. But yeah. if, mm -hmm. it, if it gets them in legal trouble to where it has to be imposed, can we then impound the vehicle because we were going to assess the business owner a fee. If we're doing it, can we get the teeth to impound it and assess the person? More so than the businesses. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, well, and if we had the avenue for a place to take that vehicle to that could be stored off-site and out of sight, uh, I don't have the legal answers to you at the moment, but we can certainly find out if this is a possible solution that we could assist our, like you said, our good, upstanding businesses and help keep the city looking nice. It just seems like we put together an ordinance to do something and we're just diluting it piece by piece maybe. We haven't got to it, but it kind of seems like that. Elena? Who would be the person that would go and monitor these? Would this be our community? See a community service community officer, service. yes. Okay. Which and unfortunately, for about the last six or eight months, we've been short one staff person. That is being rectified now. Uh, so once we are back to full staff with our CSO, I think we can 
uh, step up our enforcement. Any further discussion? Something that we're going to look into then as far as uh, legalities? We, we, yeah, there. on that other question. But before us tonight is the question on the text amendment. If we want to uh, approve the text amendment, which there has not been a motion at And we this could point. still have the screening as a conditional on the on a conditional use permit? Yep. Yeah. And this is for all new businesses or this is old businesses? As this well? would be any new business, a business that's relocating, or a grandfathered in business that's expanding now has to come back for a conditional use permit. Okay. Okay. I'll move to approve the first reading. Okay. We have a second? I'll second. Okay. All in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Any further discussion? Opposed. Okay. We want opposed. We want opposed. Okay. Motion's carried. All right. Next up here, this is a discussion item on a request to allow chickens in city limits here. So about a month ago, March 13th, City Council heard a request from Worthington resident Tony Vetch to allow chickens within city limits. After some discussion, Council requested the staff do some additional research before bringing the topic back for discussion. Um, I won't go through all of that. The gist of it here, some cities don't allow it, period. Some cities do with varying regulations. Um, I actually think Mr. Vetch did a nice job of kind of finding the middle ground between regulations and other cities, and he certainly did his homework on that. Um, following that, you'll see some other city code sections that will either need to be amended um, or changed in some way if we choose to allow chickens and chicken coops and that kind of thing. And then lastly, there is just some other... Um, kind of main topics that staff would be thinking through. Um, I think at this point, what we're looking for tonight is whether council wants to move forward. Um, and then if so, the next step, we would draft some regulations for chicken coops and the necessary changes for more formal discussion on that. Any, Elena? Um, this is an unrelated animal, but do we know how many, approximately how many dogs we have permitted in the city of Worthington? No, I don't have an answer for you. I, I, I feel like we heard that number like a year ago, and I think that the number of people that actually on an annual basis go and register their dogs is a very, very low amount um, compared to how many there actually are within the city of Worthington. And so kind of in those same, along that same avenue, I really struggle to think that people will come in and they will actually register these chicken coops. We currently already have people that live in the city that have chickens inside of their home. Um, and outside. I've heard, and outside. I mean, I really struggle with thinking that we have the necessary employees to enforce anything like this. Um, and kind of along that, we've had an influx, I'd say, of outreaches from members of the community saying that they've I don't think I've had anyone else tell me that they actually support this. I've had everyone saying that they do not support this, or if they, do, if we are going to move forward, we need to look. We can't just choose chickens. We need to look at all sorts of animals to see whether goats should be allowed and other animals as well. So I, I know that I'm very, very hesitant to continue moving forward with this. Yep, Chad. Um, I, I agree. Tony did a. a mm -hmm very good presentation um, I know his education and his background uh, in criminal law uh, uh, law enforcement and stuff like that so I know he looked at things that people you should be commended uh, for a presentation like that and people should take note of how you actually make a good presentation on, on an ordinance or proposed ordinance or change mm -hmm. um, that doesn't happen very often, so he should be commended on that. One of the things that I found uh, just a little bit out of the context of what this would actually mean for the entire city to take place was the talk of rising costs and, and things of that sort as being one of the reasons uh, to make a change. Eggs at $4.95 a dozen, while it does stink, uh, and that is high compared to what 
we had two or three years ago, whatever. Um, I don't know too many family. I, I know there are, um, so I'll put that disclaimer out there beforehand. But I don't know a ton of families uh, that uh, if you took two dozen eggs uh, a week at $4.95, 52 weeks of the year, we're talking a total of five, fifteen, so somewhere right in that ballpark, five hundred and eighteen bucks, something like that. Um, even if they were two dollars cheaper, um, you know, we're we're at three hundred and something. So the difference of two hundred dollars in what we we were used to in egg cost to what they are now, if you ate two dozen eggs every week of the entire year as being a reason to, okay, I think it would be neat to raise some in my yard. Well, it takes four months to get a hen to become a laying hen. So you've invested $40 a bag for four or six chickens every month to get to that. A coop costs how much if there needs to be footings under that coop to protect it from varmints and or whatever from digging and getting under it, which does happen. Uh, and all of those sort of things, the money thing kind of becomes a, yeah, well, that math would take a couple of years before you'd even come close to that. So then it becomes, it's a neat hobby, in my opinion, as to why I want to do this. But does the hobby justify an entire city to have to enforce, uphold, uh, what happens when the coop screen or door breaks in a snowstorm because a tree limb fell and hit it and all of a sudden now there's chickens loose all over. Are people gonna go collect their chickens or is somebody going to have to collect those chickens? Um, when the neighbor's dog is out and then all of a sudden a chicken runs by and the dog runs after the chicken and gets uh, you know, a chicken in its mouth, what? trauma is that going to provide? I mean, there's just a gazillion things that I think we run into for a neat hobby that, for the most part, is why people buy hobby farms in a rural area and do that. I get it that, it, yep, it's being done in other places maybe, um, but it also doesn't mean that it has to be done everywhere and it isn't being done everywhere without a lot of regulation. So, plus I have concerns of, uh, if you look at uh, reports uh, just a week ago from the Minnesota uh, Board of Animal Health, um, avian flu has already been found in Minnesota this year within the last couple of weeks. Do you know where? In a backyard flock. Mm -hmm. Documented, reported, put out there. I personally know of a large poultry producer that lives in the city of Worthington that has already had to euthanize an entire facility of theirs to the tune of, to their capacity is at 550 birds, I believe it is. Uh, 500, hang on, let me put a comma and three, and three zeros yeah. by it. 550,000 birds at their facility. Um, that's a huge sum. Plus, they had to then wait six months before they could repopulate that barn. That is their livelihood, that is their life. And avian flu has been around at least, you know, multiple times in the last couple of years. Uh, do we, with an agricultural based community, and anybody could argue that if you don't think that this community still isn't based off of a backbone of agriculture, I think you're a little bit crazy, it is. That do we put something like that into risk? for a hobby. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I know they're worried about that possibly being contracted to other animals as well at this point, their mutate or whatever, so. <clears throat> Any other discussion? Input? I have heard, just to throw it out there, about 50-50, 50% 50, 50 of the people are against it, 50% of the people I talk to really, whatever, they're not excessively concerned. I've heard a few times of um, 
we could just keep the neighborhood dogs quiet, they'd be happy, you know. <laughs> so, um, that's kind of a different conversation, but yeah, it, it it's 50-50 from people I've talked to. It's like, what's your opinion? I'm totally against it. Some next person will be, I don't, yeah, whatever, you know, so. I know a lot of the towns are that had some emails from other mayors and stuff, you know, and they went through all the motions and stuff, and some of them that were looking for it didn't even bother coming back or issuing anything for having chickens, or there's only one or two, you know, it's a big undertaking to, to change some codes and regulations anyways. For but, and, I, you know, I don't know that it would pass, but if it would, not, like, not everybody's going to have chickens. Mm -hmm. You know, we think mm -hmm. like, oh, the whole town's going to have chickens. Mm -hmm. No, they wouldn't have chickens, mm -hmm. you know. But you can hear from the neighbors. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> from a neighbor that has, yeah. uh, somebody has I chickens. I've had, it, I've had it, uh, no, no, uh, no chickens at all. Yeah. I never call so them. The never hear any people bit. that have talked to me or, yep. or no. Yeah. Yep. Well, and this is kind of a, we were committed to get back to the council with uh, our initial review of this. So it's not that there's a pending decision that has to be made today. At some point, if council wants to proceed with, and you can see the lengthy list of ordinances that would have to be amended to accommodate this. So uh, whether today or sometime in the future, if council wants to make that decision, you now are briefed on what what we would have to uh, do to move forward. Uh, so it's, I guess we're not requesting a decision today. It's just when the decision is ready to come forward, this is what it is we're, we'll have to do. I have a question. Uh, don't we have an ordinance already? No, no uh, livestock? Yep. Yes, we no do. Animals. And mm -hmm. chickens are included in that. In that in that ordinance, yes. Mm -hmm. That's kind of where I mentioned, right now we can't enforce the ordinance that's already in place. So yeah. if we think about suddenly allowing chickens or other animals or anything like that, it's how, how would we suddenly enforce that if we can't enforce it right now? I just, I really struggle with that. And then one of the items was the, like the permit cost that it was proposed to not have any permitting cost. And I think that the amount of expenses that we would have to go through this entire process if we were to move forward, as well as to enforce it in the future, I think that those would be pretty, a pretty hefty amount. And so I think that we would have to have a permit um, cost associated with it. But um, yeah, I'm not. Next, is, next will be a 4-H cap. <laughs> is, it, is it a matter of That's what'll happen. that we yeah. can't enforce it, or is it a matter that we just don't? We don't. I don't think it, we've shown that we can so far, but right, right. the practice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have limited resources, so that's yeah. that's we can enforce anything we you place a priority on, but then other things may end up falling by the wayside with our current staffing levels. And it would kind of come down to the residents too, you know, if that they, they weigh huge on that factor too that. A lot of them, if they don't want chickens next to them, obviously it's not going to happen anyways. Mm -hmm. because they have just as much say. Chicken put chicken puts out one chicken will put out forty to fifty fifty five uh, pounds of manure per chicken per year. Uh, you put that in a coop of <coughs> even if you're limited to six hens. I don't know that I want that as a neighbor myself either. So. Got direction? I, I Got don't direction? see any. Uh, it definitely uh, got the hen house clucking. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. My phone is I, I, I don't see that council is asking for any any action at this point. Coffee tables talking. And, yep. All right. It was a good all. topic of discussion. An excellent huh? night, Matt. <laughs> 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 what else? Uh, that was the ultimate dash. Too, too like I, I, I mean, I applaud. That was the dab. I mean, he did a great presentation. Right. And I, I mean, people should take note of how mm -hmm. you do it. 
Some of, these bigger, right some of these bigger towns, I don't know if they have just certain areas that they have that. I can't imagine through the whole I don't think so. I don't know. city, town. So. Yeah, I don't know if it would be different classifications of the yeah. housing or how, how they yeah. would do it. And the outskirts or center of town? Or? I don't know if space would matter okay. or not. We'll go on to council reports. I have nothing. I have nothing. I have no report. No reports. Um, my only report would be that this Friday is the um, Artrageous show at the Memorial Auditorium. So I know I will be bringing my children and my husband with me. So tickets are still available through Memorial Auditorium. And that's all I've got. Okay, Chan. Uh, just so everyone knows, uh, Elena and Todd and myself and Steve at times, uh, <laughs> we've been meeting the getting everything geared up for the aquatic center uh, to... Let's open tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and then what do, you do the, what do you do the week after? I don't know. It's supposed to be 45 to 55. But, uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff happening with that. So just so you know, uh, our committee has been feverishly uh, nice. yeah. backstroking and front stretch, and we got we, we all kinds of stuff going. So we met again today. Lots of stuff going, so <laughs> paddle away soon. Steve? Okay, reminder, uh, next Tuesday the 18th, we have a work session at 4 o'clock. Am I right? Yes. Yep. Cindy? Special meeting. Uh, we'll be discussing the industrial wastewater treatment facility. Uh, Christina Adame has more than a week on the job, jumping into a lot of things. She's uh, still coming back. Huh? And she's still coming back? She's still coming back. Uh, and the last couple of days and today, she's been uh, scheduling what we're calling Food Truck Fridays at the Pavilion. Sure. So we'll have, nice. Nice. the hope is to have food trucks and some musical entertainment. Uh, we're going to start with about three Fridays in through the summertime, uh, working around all of the other activities that are going on in town. Uh, we have been uh, interviewing and working with uh, the assistant engineering position. We have uh, uh, we've had some uh, Zoom sessions, and this coming Friday we have an in-person interview. And the following Friday, the 21st, we're trying to line up a second uh, interview with a second individual, a couple of a uh, couple of people that uh, uh, really meet exactly what we're looking for at this time and and are interested in this position so we're we're excited and hopeful that we'll have that position filled in uh, late May early June and last week uh, we we had a zoom meeting with uh, Steve Schneider and, and goo and myself and our dam consultant and the uh, dam safety engineer with Mindat and uh, we are going to be on the filling out paperwork to get on the priority list so that we can eventually uh, qualify for state funding to do upgrades and repairs to the uh, Lake Okabina Outlet Dam. So did you have anything to add, Steve, to that? Did I cover? Yes. We'll be, we'll be asking. It sounds like uh, in our conversation that we weren't necessarily on the top of the list based on the existing condition of the dam compared to other dams. There's about 100 projects right now that they have sitting waiting for funding that have put applications in, and they do maybe eight every two years. Mm -hmm. So we'll yeah. maybe a few years before, we'll, we, uh, before we might come to the top yeah. of the list. Which is why we started now, because we knew that it was you know some number of years down the road. Good to put it on the radar. That's all I have, Mayor. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Are you? All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.